Okay, so today we're going to have a look at Exam 7 of the College Board Official SAT Study Guide 2016. The equation above relates the number of minutes x Maria spends running each day and the number of minutes y she spends biking each day. In the equation, what does the number 75 represent? Um, well, it looks like 75 is the total number of uh, uh, minutes that she spends biking or uh, running. So let's see if that's a choice. Uh, no, no, Riking and, yeah, this is the one, right? <clears throat> Which of the following is, the equi is equivalent to this? So we distribute 3x plus 15 minus 6. Um, so then we combine like terms. Plus 15 with a minus 6 gives a plus 9. And so that looks like answer choice C. Which ordered pair satisfies the system of equations shown above? So what we do here, we can do a substitution. Okay, We substitute uh, this in for x, because it's already isolated. So substitution is also known as isolate and plug in. Isolate and plug in. Okay, So if something is already isolated, that already saves you one step. So anyway, we plug in y minus 3 here. Okay. And whenever we have this long division bar here, we always should keep in mind that there's parentheses around any uh, binomial or trinomial terms there. So from here, um, there's a few ways we could finish. right? One way is we can sort of interpret this as a common denominator and divide it to each one separately. So let's do that. So we have y over 2 minus 3 over 2. Okay. Um, then, if you prefer, you could use decimal equivalents. So 1 half is really 0.5 times y. And then minus, this comes out to 1.5 in the calculator. Okay. Makes your life a little easier. So you don't have to combine fractions, just decimals. And then we're combining this with this. That gives us 2.5y. And then we have to add 1.5 to both sides. So that gives us 7.5 here. And we divide. And that goes in three times. So we know y is 3. And the only one with y value of 3 is that. Which of the following complex numbers is equal to this? Okay, we have 5 plus 12i. And then we have m minus, we have to distribute that. So it's minus 9i squared, and it's also plus 6i, right? So right away we can combine these two. That makes 18i. Now we have to remember that since i is rad minus 1, if we square both sides, we get that i squared is equal to minus 1, because the radical and the square cancel. So wherever we see i squared, we can plug in a minus 1, in particular here. So that's minus 9 times minus 1, okay? which is, of course, positive 9. And then we could combine these, and that makes 14 uh, plus 18i, choice D. Okay, if f of x equals this, what is the value of f of minus 1? So this is telling us what to plug in for x. So we could go here, here, and here. So minus 1 squared minus 6 minus 1 plus 3 over minus 1 minus 1. All right, it's a good habit to, when you plug in to a function, use parentheses around the thing you're plugging in. Okay. So minus 1 squared is 1. Now minus 6 times minus 1 is plus 6. Then you have minus 1 minus 1 is minus 2. The numerator comes out to 10 over negative 2. 10 over 2 is 5. We still have a minus sign. Okay. A company that makes wildlife videos purchases camera equipment for this. The equipment depreciates in value at a constant rate for 12 years, after which it is considered to have no monetary value. How much is the camera equipment worth four years after it's purchased? Okay. Uh, well, let's see. So, Normally, um, when we think of depreciation, uh, we think of that in terms of an exponential decay. 
So we think of it in terms of a multiplier, which would cause this sort of ever decreasing but never quite reaching zero behavior, known as exponential decay. Okay. Um, but in this case, actually, this is not what we're going to see because and we know that because uh, we know it's worth zero at 12 years. So we know that this is more of a linear situation because otherwise we would never be able to reach a value of zero. Okay. So since we have a linear situation, we can look at the slope, right? So the first point is at an x value of zero but has a height or value of 32,400, okay? Then, after time of 12 elapses, um, the rate, uh, sorry, the value is at zero, okay? So we can figure out the slope of this function by doing a change in y over change in x, right? So it looks like the change in y is that it goes down by 32,400, and then the change in x is that it goes up by 12. So grab our calculator here, and we could divide those numbers. Okay, so we'll do 32,400 divided by 12. All right, that gives 2,700. And keep in mind it's negative, right? So this is how much it depreciates uh, each year, right? So after four years, we can subtract this four times, right? So we take the original amount, which was our 32,400, and we subtract this four times. So this is what it should then be. Okay, so take that number, multiply it by f four, and then take 32,400 and subtract that answer. We get 216. Right. Which of the following is equivalent to the expression above? So it looks like we would have to factor it, but when I check the choices, um, it actually looks more like a completing the square situation. Right. So when we do completing the square, it's best to put the 4 on the other side. Okay. It's just to kind of push it aside for now. And now we can come up with the key number. To find the key number, we take this middle piece, we half it and square it. So half of 6 is 3, and that squared is 9. This gets added to both sides. At this point, the left side now becomes factorable, okay, by trinomial factoring. So we get x plus 3, x plus 3, right, because the numbers 3 and 3, they add to 6 while multiplying to 9. 9 minus 4 is 5, okay. Now you can rewrite the left side as a perfect square. It would be x plus 3, whole thing squared. And then you could subtract the 5 back over to the left-hand side. Okay. And this should match one of our choices, and it does. Ken is working this summer as part of a crew on a farm. He earned $8 per hour for the first 10 hours. So $8 per hour for 10 hours. So if you compute that result, you multiply these numbers together, hours cancels out, and you get $80 that he earned. Because of his performance, his crew leader raised his salary to $10 per hour for the rest of the week. Okay. Ken saves 90% of his earnings from each week. What is the least number of hours he must work the rest of the week? Okay, so that's the question. How many hours for the rest of the week? So let's that have that be X. Number of hours for the rest of the week. And he's making $10 per hour in the time spent times X hours, right? So this is how much money he's going to make in that X hours. And he's going to save 90% of his earnings, right? So first we have to take this and we have to add the $80 he's already made in the beginning of the week, okay? So if you notice, yes, hours and hours cancels again to give us 10X, the unit being dollars, 80, the unit is also dollars, so we can add those. And this will give us his total sort of um, salary for that week, right? Um, so 
but that's not the amount that he's saving. He's saving 90% of that. 90% can be written as a decimal as 0.90, right? And then of means times. So 0.90 times this amount, uh, that'll give us the amount that he saves. Okay. And he wants to save $270. That's his goal. So we could take this expression and make it equal to 270, right? So that'll pretty much be the idea here. Now we could distribute this 0.90, um, but what might be more sort of wise is to actually divide it to the other side. All right. So then we get 80 plus 10x equals, and if we divided this 9 into 27, right? In other words, let's see. Um, yeah, so we can actually move the decimal once to the right here, and we'd have to move it once to the right in the numerator as well, giving us an extra 0. Okay? That's the same thing as multiplying by 10 on top and bottom. Okay? Um, then you could go 9 into 27. Right, because each extra zero is just a 10, so that's really 100. Okay, 27 times 100, in other words. Now, 27 over 9 is 3, right? 3 times 100 is 300. So then we could subtract 80, both sides. That gives us 220. Divide by 10, we get x equals 22. Okay. Marissa needs to hire at least 10 staff members for an upcoming project. The staff members will be made up of juniors and seniors with different pay rates. Her budget is this. She must hire at least three juniors and one senior. Okay. So X is the number of juniors. Y is the number of seniors. So let's make all these constraints. Starting with the easiest ones. She must hire at least three juniors. So if x is the number of juniors, then x has to be at least three. Meaning that x could also be more than three or equal to three. Similarly, y, meaning the number of seniors, would have to be at least one. Okay, so y could be greater than one or equal to one. So already I can perhaps start eliminating. All right, this has the wrong one, so does this. Okay, now I can point out any difference here and just see if I can figure it out. Okay, so, so I've already done that restraint and we must hire at least 10 staff members. So the number of staff members would be juniors plus seniors and at least we learned is greater than, right? Greater than or equal to 10. So our best answer is choice B. We don't even have to discuss this one, but m maybe you're curious anyway as to how that works. So let's just talk about it briefly. So $640 per week, right? Um, technically this is dollars per week per staff member. Okay. So they kind of use the wrong units there. And then if you multiply that by, for example, X uh, junior staff members, so this would be junior staff members, junior staff, then the junior staff will cancel, okay? And then you'll have sort of 640X dollars per week. But anyway, that's a little more complicated than what I want to discuss right now. In the equation above, these four letters are constants. If the equation has roots this, which of the following is a factor? Okay. So you can look at the roots and you can decide right away what the factors will be, right? Because root means that x equals that, right? So this is really like the bottom and then we have to sort of work our way back up. So what we can do is we can add one to both sides here, getting this, add three to both sides, giving this, Subtract 5 from both sides will give you this. And then what we can think of is we could think of these three, all right, as separate factors that were sort of t-charted, right? So remember when we t-chart, 
um, we end up breaking this into different possibilities, right? Um, so, it, yeah, it's kind of the reverse process here. We start with the roots, and we work our way back up to the original. But anyway, uh, x plus 1 is a factor, as you can see right here. These are the list of factors. All right, this expression is equivalent to which of the following? Okay, so we have to use our exponent rules here. Okay, um, my first sort of piece of advice for this question would be anytime you have a negative exponent that's in the midst of a fraction, that tells you that really it's on the wrong side of the fraction. Okay, so this y to the minus 1 can be brought up to the top where it would be y to the plus 1. Okay, so it gets removed from here. Similarly, this x to the minus 2 would be happier down here where it can be x to the plus 2. Okay. So in summary here we have one to the y to the one half times y to the first over x squared times x to the one third. Okay. At this point we quickly sort of peek at the answers to see what kind of format they want. And it seems like as you can see here, they sort of want radical format, right? So every time we see a one half power, we'll use the radical. So the numerator here, we have a y, and we have a y to the one-half, which means radical y, All right? The denominator, we've got an x squared, and we have an x to the one-third, which is really a cubed root, which is written thusly, okay? So this seems to match up with choice D. The function f is defined by this. The graph of f in the xy plane is a parabola. Which of the following intervals contains the x-coordinate of the vertex of the graph of f? Okay, so let's see. Um, all right, so we're really we're looking for the vertex, right? And the nicest way to do this one is actually to find the roots by setting equal to zero in t-chart. Okay, so here we get x equals negative three, x equals negative one. So if these are sort of of a coefficient of one, you can just take the negative of the other number, all right? So anyway, um, when we look at the graph, this is of course going to be a parabola because it has x squared as its highest order when you foil it out. And it's going to have roots of negative three and negative one. And it has a positive x squared, so it's going to be facing upwards like this. and by way of symmetry, we can determine that the vertex is going to be somewhere around here. So in terms of its x value, it's going to be sandwiched in between minus 3 and minus 1. So if we take an average of those, we end up with minus 2 as our x value for our axis of symmetry. Okay, so we know the vertex is going to be um, at minus 2, right? which is in this interval here. Which of the following expressions is equivalent to this? All right. So at first glance, this looks like it could be factored down and maybe cancel something out. But then when you look closer, you see that they're actually separating it out into pieces. Okay. So this is a process known as fraction, partial fraction decomposition, which the, in the forwards direction is quite complicated. Um, in the backwards direction, it's not so bad, um, but there's also another way we could do it, which is sort of long division, right? So let's explore that option first. So we'll set it up just like if we had sort of numbers, right, with this long division sign. Then the question we ask is, what do I have to multiply by to get x squared, right? So I have to multiply by x. And then when you distribute that x, you get x squared minus 3x, okay? And now the thing to do is to subtract the lines. But since that's a little bit tricky to do, what I indicate is, or advise rather, is 
to negate both pieces, and then just combined normally via addition. So x squared minus x squared, this cancels. And then you have minus 2x with a plus 3x, that makes a plus 1x. Then you could drop the minus 5 down, okay? This just goes in once, okay? And then the axes will match. And we have to do another subtraction here. And so we have to switch these signs, and then x minus x cancels. Minus 5 with a plus 3 gives you minus 2. That is what's known as your remainder, and typically we will put the remainder over the divisor, right? So this is what our answer looks like, and that's going to be um, this choice down here. A shipping service restricts the dimensions of the boxes it will ship for a certain type of service. The restriction states that the box is shaped like rectangular prisms. Uh, the sum of the perimeter of the base of the box and the height of the box cannot exceed 130. All right, so let's try to draw a rectangular prism. We can start by drawing a rectangle. Then offset at the center, we draw a rectangle of a similar size. And then we connect the edges, okay? So, um, uh, let's see, okay. If a box has 60 inches height, so here's 60, and its length is 2.5 times the width. So we don't know the width, but this is going to be 2.5 times that width. Um, which inequality shows the available width in inches? Okay, so they're using W, or sorry, they're using X. So I'd better switch my width letter to X. Okay, and now we need to come up with the... Uh, Using this constraint, we need to come up with a constraint on our parameter x. Okay, so the perimeter of the base of the box. All right, so the sum of the perimeter of the base of the box and the height of the box. The sum of the perimeter of the base of the box. So the perimeter of the base of the box would be, well, it would have x on those two sides, and then it would have 2.5x on the front and back portions. And then f from that, we have to add the height. So the sum of this uh, cannot exceed, means it has to be less than or equal to 130, right? So now we just combine like terms. So we get x and x and 2 and a half and 2 and a half is 5, 6, 7. So 7x plus 60, okay, subtract 60. So that would equal 70. Divide by 7 and get x is less than or equal to 10. Okay, uh, choice A. This expression can be rewritten as this. What's the value of k? All right, one third x squared minus 2 equals 1 third and then sort of looks like a difference of two squares. All right. So you have two different possible ways of solving this. On the one hand, we can look to the left and we can try and factor it out, first using GCF, then dots. Or we can look to the right and foil this out, um, then compare terms uh, on left and right sides. So let's see which option that we should take. I think the easier one is foiling out. So let's try that first. So we'll get x squared here, then the inner will be minus kx, and the outer will be plus kx, and then the last will be, whoops, the last will be minus k squared. Okay. Now this uh, inner and outer will cancel. Just giving this. Right. And so now they're starting to look more similar. <clears throat> I can distribute the one third in. One third x squared minus one third k squared. One third x squared minus two. 
Now I could subtract a one-third x squared from both sides. That would destroy this information. Okay. And now, from here, right, what I would like to realize, first of all, is that one-third k squared is the same thing as k squared over three, right? Multiplying by a third is the same as dividing by three. Now, I've got minus on both sides, so I can negate every single item, making both positive, okay? Then I can take this three and move it diagonally across the equal sign, since it's a factor. Another way to think of that is I can multiply by three on both sides, but I don't prefer that uh, conceptualization. Anyway, we get k squared equals six, and we square root both sides to get k equals radical six. Choice D. Right, so we're now in the grid ends. All right, so they want x plus four. So there may be a little shortcut here. If we factor out a two, notice how we get what we want in the parentheses, so we can then divide by two. Okay, and we get eight for our result. The figure above, MQ and NR intersect. Okay, that's kind of obvious. NP equals QP, so NP equals QP, right? MP, so that's this one equals PR, which is this. What is the measure of the degrees QMR? QMR, so they want this here. Let's call it X. Okay, so a few things we can notice. First of all, we have a vertical angles here. And anytime you have an X, any angle across from each other is gonna be equal. So that tells us this is 60, right? Um, what else can we notice? Let's see. Well, certainly, uh, this bottom triangle is a, what we would call a um, isosceles, right? So I can put an X also in this position here, meaning that these angles are the same. And then I can see that this would make a straight angle. So a straight angle, as you could tell, is half a circle, so it's 180 degrees. So 60 less 180, right? That makes 120 left over for this side here to fill it up. Okay, so now that I have 120 here, I know that these three have to add up to 180 because they're the interior of a triangle. Plus x plus x equals 180. I can then subtract 120 from both sides. And I get 2x equals 60, which means x equals 30. And that's my answer. The number of radians in a 720 degree angle can be written as a pi. What is a? All right. So they want to take 720 degrees and convert that into radians. So we need a conversion factor. And basically we know that pi radians corresponds with 180 degrees, right? So two pi would equal 360, for example. So anyway, uh, we, we'd like to use this as a conversion factor. And a factor, of course, is a fraction in this case. Um, written vertically, we have pi radians over 180 degrees. So this is our conversion factor, right? So we're either going to sort of multiply it by this way or flip it upside down, then multiply. So the, the objective here is to get rid of degrees. So to get rid of degrees, we'd like for degrees to be on the bottom of our fraction. Okay? So using this dimensional analysis concept, um, the degrees sign will cancel, okay? And we'll end up with, um, what, 720 pi over 180. Now, this of course can be reduced, so for example, this zero will cancel out on top and bottom. And then 18 goes into 72. Well, how many times does it go? I think four. So that means it's equal to four pi. Uh, well, that tells us the value of A would just simply be 4, okay? The graph of the line in the XY plane passes through the point 1, 4. So anytime they give a point, usually we label it XY. 
crosses the x-axis at the point 2, 0. If the line crosses the y-axis at the point 0, b, what is the value of b? So we want to find the y-intercept of this given line. So we actually have two points. We have also x2, y2. So generally, when we're given two points that have the same, on the same line, we're, our objective is going to be to find the slope, right? So to do a slope, you can do your old formula, which is m equals sort of x2 minus x1 or something. I don't like it. I have my own formula. What I use is change y over change in x, okay? So change in y, you're going to go from, let's say, 0 to 4. So that would be going up 4. Then change in x, you're going from 2 to 1. That's going down 1. So altogether, your slope is negative 4, right? So once you have your slope, you're also going to want sort of an x and a y. So let's use x and y here, okay? Reason being is that we have this formula. We just figured out m. We want to use x and y in order to figure out b. So we plug in. y is 0, m is negative 4, x is 2. Right, negative 8 plus b equals 0. We can add 8 and find that b is equal to 8. Okay. Um, yep. Question 20. The expression above can be written in this form. What is the value of a plus b? Right. So ay squared plus b. Um, let's see. The first thing I would thing to do here is to distribute this 10. All right, that'll give us 100 y squared minus 1100. Zero, zero. Now I can combine the y squared terms. That will give me 200 y squared. And I can also combine the other terms. I'll grab the calculator for that, although it's easy calculation. So 77, seven, sorry. I'll just do it by hand. 7532, 1100, zero, zero, subtract uh, 4 and 6. So 6432. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, now this is of that form. Right? A y squared plus b. So the value of a is 200, and the value of b is 6432. So if I add those together, I'm going to get 6632. Okay.